Okay, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the second edition of Goggle Box with myself, Michael, and uh, my friend and colleague, John. Hi, yeah. Are you alright then, John? No, I'm not bad, thanks, Michael. Good, so um, this is the second go that we've had. I um, wouldn't call it a go because I think we're kind of uh, well practised in this now. So I Yeah, think everything we, uh, we nailed it last week. Yeah, well, so somebody said, I'm not sure who it was, maybe. Anyway, um, so how are we going to work today? We're going to talk about um, a little bit about what's happened in college this week and then we're going to go a bit further into the world of the wider media and then we've got something at the end where you're going to ask me something aren't you John? Yeah a new slot for you we're going to uh, we're going to do like a like a high fidelity thing where we do top three um, films in a certain category so so are you going to set them for me now so I can we are, think about yeah. them? So, so while we're um, while we're talking I want you to think of the 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 best three sports films ever made. Sports films ever. Oh. Okay. I'll and as well, if the um, if anybody's listening to us, um, we'd like you. People are listening to us, John. Are they? Yeah. We'd like you to suggest top three that we can do next week. So if you've got any ideas of categories, top three films, maybe you want to give us your top three films, and we'll uh, we'll we'll do a quick rundown. Maybe mention your name and. That kind of thing. Okay. Right, okay. So shall we make a start then? So I'll have a think about the top three sports films. And what I'm going to talk to you, or what I'm going to ask you now, is uh, narrative. You've been looking a bit about narrative this week with the students. Do you want to just kind of recap what, what you've been talking about? Yeah, well, it kind of follows on from genre. We've been looking at narrative structure, the way in which people tell stories basically and we start very very simply by explaining to people exactly what narrative means which is basically that all stories have similar structures and that those structures are given to us and we learn them at a very very young age and we start off by saying things like all stories have a beginning a once upon a time then a middle there was an evil wizard who cast a spell on a, a young man who was in love with a frog <laughs> that kind of thing and then an ending oh, okay. we slay the evil wizard and everybody lives happily ever Yay. after so that that kind of thing really but then we've been looking at the way in which we can apply that to the world of film okay so that's fairy stories how does it work with film well with film there's various different there's lots of famous theorists that have analyzed um, stories in film and analyzed the way in which stories are told and they've developed ideas Using what we, as we call them, big learning book words like disequilibrium, neo-equilibrium, to describe the various different stages that that narrative structures go through, and also the the specific characters that might be involved in stories at any one time. Okay, so give me an example. Well, so um, Zvitan Todorov, he looked at fairy is that stories. An anagram, or is that a... That's a real name. Okay, a real name. And I always say that he's Russian, but he's not. He's not Russian at all. But he is Eastern he's, European. He's taking his time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what what he said was that um, the important thing about, about Todorov is not in the way that he's analysing the different sections, so beginning, middle and end, equilibrium, disequilibrium, new equilibrium. It's not the way he's analysing that. It's what he says about those sections. And he says that the most important part is the disequilibrium. Because that's where the characters that you've introduced are forced into taking some action. Okay, so equilibrium where the world is in perfect balance and harmony. Yeah. Okay. Once upon a time. You introduce the characters, you set the scene, you uh, you tell us what their likes and dislikes are, you get us interested in the the general way of life of the character. So taking Star Wars, for example, you've got Luke Skywalker... He's just kind of milling about. He's not doing much. Zapping some womp rats and uh, <laughs> working on um, Uncle Owen's moisture farm. <laughs> and then something happens to change all that. <laughs> he has to go on a magical quest. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, what happens is he, he, he discovers something um, in his kind of intergalactic antiques hunt. Yeah, that was the moisture farm that did yeah. it, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. sorry. 
Yeah, so um, so something happens, and that thing that happens forces him into action. And that's the really, really important thing about narrative structure. It's a, it's a structure that forces a story along, and really, without that disequilibrium, without that story being pushed along, we wouldn't have a film in the first place. Okay, brilliant. So that's narrative, really. In a nutshell, or is there more to add, do you think? No, I think that's it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's... Are um, there any exceptions that totter off? Yeah, of? I mean, we, we looked very, very carefully, which is going to lead us on to the next point. We looked very, very carefully at the way in which narrative works in more art-based films. So we looked at the way in which narrative works in a genre film called film noir, which basically you have the ending at the start and then everything flows after that. Okay, a bit like Columbo almost, yeah. although you wouldn't call <laughs> Columbo a, a, your classic film noir star, would you? No, what would you call Columbo? I'd call him when I was in trouble. <laughs> What's film noir for those people who don't know? Okay, okay. So, um, film noir is one of my favourite fa- favourite genres for okay. a number of different reasons. We talked last week about all genres being linked to certain social events, and film noir v- is very firmly located in the period after the Second World War, where we've got soldiers returning from the war to find that their jobs have been kind of usurped and taken over by women in society so it's the first time that we see women in prominent in, in prominent employment positions in society so women have now got power and film noir was really about an examination of that so film noir is a genre that's concerned with with the question of whether bad women can make good men do evil things okay so uh, from the top off the top of your head stuff like um Postman or ring always rings twice. That's mm. one. Um, double indemnity. A lot of the Hitchcock stuff. Yeah, um, there's certain elements of genre that are that are very important to the film noir genre. The most important one, perhaps, is the establishment of of the main character uh, performing narration over the top of the film. So a film noir always starts with a confession. So the main character will will either be have been arrested by the police or they'll be talking into a recording device or something similar and they'll be explaining to you how they got into that position. Right. So, so the story unfolds. It so kind of negates, well, it not negates, it stands in for the backstory really so we can get straight boom into the plot. It does, yeah. And and what it does is it, it as we spoke last week, audiences will always look for elements of genre Audiences do the same thing with narrative. So a lot of the pleasure that people get from a film noir is that they know things are out of order. Right. And they have to work very hard to put them back into the right order. Okay. A bit like a puzzle in many mm. ways. And and so it develops on from those classic films in, in the 1940s to what we call in the present day neo-noir. Um, things like probably the most famous of the neo-noirs, Blade Runner. So okay, so uh, Blade Runner. We've just been watching that with the uh, Level Two group. Mm. Sometimes I think many people will admit this, myself included. I just don't know what the hell's going on. Okay. Um, I know you love the film. I love the film. Yeah. But from a, maybe from a different point of view, I love the way it looks, and I love the the fact that it's um, it was so different when it came out to really anything that had gone on before. Ridley Scott's a great director. Uh, Harrison Ford, you know, fresh off the back of um, Star Wars, um, playing that kind of sci-fi character, really. I th- just think it's a stunning film in terms of the visuals and the aesthetics. But with the storyline, I think sometimes it's a little bit difficult to understand. Would you yeah. agree? Yeah, I think a modern audience would find it really slow. Yeah. But I, I think that's the the key thing to Blade Runner. It probably doesn't appeal to audiences of, of the present who are used to kind of being abused every time they go to the cinema by, you know, really, be, you know, a, a cinema experience at the moment is a real sort of assault and battery of various different images and audio. Then Blade Runner is a much more gentle film, although there's crescendos of violence there. It's a much gentler pace and it catches people off guard a little bit. I love it because a lot of people say, well, why does it have to be five different versions of, of Blade Runner? And I actually think in this case it's justified because... Ridley Scott set out to make 
You're uh, not talking about remakes here, are you? No, I'm talking about recuts of the original film or very, very subtle changes to the original film. Uh, Ridley Scott set out to make what was a very run-of-the-mill sci-fi film but ended up making what has become a cult classic. Right. It, it slowly built its popularity over sort of a 20, 30 year, 30 year period. Because of that and because of its cult status, Ridley Scott's always been slightly um, hesitant about putting his name to any of the cuts that were released. Right. The studios messed about with the first cut famously. Yeah. When it was released, they didn't think the audience would understand it. And so they had Harrison Ford perform a voiceover over the top of the whole film. Which is in line with the... Which is in line with film noir. Yeah. That didn't work. And so in subsequent cuts, Ridley Scott took that out, rearranged certain things. Uh, the original had um, a happy ending, a so-called happy ending. Spoiler alert. Which was made out of, um, believe it or not, excerpts from other films. Right. So the studio basically just found footage from another film, cut it into the end of it. Yeah and release that. Ridley Scott was never happy with it. The very, very latest release, the final cut, that sort of as close to the original as Ridley Scott can get. His vision. His vision for right. the film. And actually it's whereas Star Wars, I, I really hate the fact that they've gone back and they've mm. changed the uh the Han Solo shooting scene so um and they've they've made Jabba the Hutt walk across floors yeah, and things yeah. like that. I really don't like any of that stuff. But the changes Ridley Scott's made are so beautifully done and so in keeping with the original vision of the film yeah. that it's. I, I just think it's um, a wonderful piece of filmmaking. I'm so, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. Uh, one last thing before we move on to the next point, though, is I think it's worth noting that Ridley Scott was so kind of dissatisfied with the studio and he made his name really after Blade Runner that now all the films that he does he always has what's known as final cut privilege yeah, yeah. so that it's, it's his cut effectively I mean and the only reason why we have the subsequent cuts is because some naughty um, stu studio worker snuck out copies of Ridley Scott's version right uh, by by accidentally on purpose so that's the reason why people ri people knew that it existed in the first place right okay in this section of the programme we normally move on to talk about something that's happened either in the world of media or in the news that we think is really important. And Michael, I believe you, you've you sort of got a personal bugbear with the, uh, the amount of celebrity panel shows or celebrity game shows that are appearing at the moment. We yep. seem to get a new one every couple of weeks. You've just totally ruined my slot now, John. That's it. That's, <laughs> that's it. No, yeah, you, you're dead right. Um, something that really, really annoys me, I was thinking about this the other day, that um, whereas in the past um, with television, what we had was it was an audience participation and it, in the in the sense that the audience normal, ordinary, everyday people were actually on the television. So you get things like, you know, Sale of the Century. Um, I'm, I am not uh, in my 60s, by the way. Sale of the Century, uh, Mr. and Mrs., Family Fortunes, you name it. There were all sorts of kind of quizzes. And Mr. and Mrs. Family Fortunes. Mr. and Mrs. Family Fortunes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 they're a lovely couple. Uh, John and Vera, they are. Um, and so you'd get ordinary people on television but now what i've noticed is you there's a, almost a, a, a dearth of ordinary people on television so for instance you it's no longer family fortunes it's all star family fortunes hosted by that brilliant presenter vernon k with his perma tan and glow white smile whereas before you would get Ordinary Master, well, it wasn't called Ordinary Master Chef, it was called Master Chef, but it's Celebrity Master Chef, it's Celebrity Big Brother, it's strictly come dancing, so it's with celebrities. So, all of these programs that once were populated by normal people, they're now the sole reserve of call it, call them what you want, we'll call them stars or celebrities. And I think the reason for that, and I may be wrong, this is just a theory of mine, I think the reason for that is that there is such a a vast amount of TV shows nowadays, and what we've done is created, with the birth over the last sort of 10, 15 years, with the birth of the internet, we've created so many 
different stars and celebrities and what have you that there's nothing else for them to do. Mm. So you get people from Coronation Street being on Family Fortunes. I'm not just, it's not that I just, I don't just dislike Family Fortunes, that's the example. Whereas that sort of should be a normal person being on television. You know, what, what was it Andy Warhol said? Everybody will be famous for 15 minutes. Yeah, but well, I don't think that's true anymore. Yeah. Because I think the people who were going to be famous for 15 minutes are kind of holding on to that limelight so that it's going to be they're getting the half hour. And so on celebrity programmes, yeah, they, they do win money for, for, for charity. That's great. Uh, so you get um, who wants to be a millionaire, and that's, you know, admirable. But on the other side of things, you know, you go on MasterChef and you, you end up winning a nice trophy that really, actually, you've you've probably got loads of money yourself mm. anyway. I hate that on um, on all-star family fortunes where the celebrity wins a golfing holiday. Absolutely. I don't quite understand why that would happen. And that's just something that really, really kind of bugs me, mm. is that ordinary people aren't getting the opportunities that they used to. So why do you think that's happened then? Is it the fault of the 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 media industry for making the programs or is it the fault of the audience for for lapping those programs up well there's there's the theory that um in economics there's something called supply side and then there's something called demand side so it depends depends which side of that thing you fall on and um i think actually it's a little bit of both the media has given us this lifestyle that people can aspire to and i think the public have lapped up that so I think a little bit of both. I think originally the media industry is to blame, but now, you know. Mm. So what's the, you know, and you've, you've spoken about all-star family fortunes. What's the, your personal, you know, if there's one that's like the, the ultimate in bad I would taste. Have to, I would have to say X Factor. Right. Because I don't even think it's about the singers. It's about the personalities on the panel. Mm. And when you get somebody like Danny Minogue with a failed pop career and a failed acting career, now launching herself as some form of style icon, basically because she's been a judge on The X Factor. In actual fact, she's probably more memorable than any of the of the people that they're trying to find. I just think it's really sad. Mm. But not enough to make me cry. No. So. The... Um the, you, you've seen that Simon Cowell's just released or just just started a run of X Factor USA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's launched it as you know we, we've never had this before in in America, which is just the same program as American Idol, absolutely, but with his branding on it, and he gets all the money for it. Yeah. The interesting thing is that um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Chuck Cunningham syndrome. Have you ever heard of that? No. no. Chuck Cunningham, uh, Happy Days. Oh R yeah. Richie Cunningham's older brother. Right. right? When the first series of Happy Days f came out, the producers had a slot for um, uh, older, wiser, um, handsome, cool brother. It was Chuck Cunningham. What they didn't factor on was the Fonzie being so popular. So at the end of episode 10 on the first series of Happy Days, Chuck Cunningham, baseball bat over his shoulder, walks upstairs, never mentioned again totally disappeared right so there's something called chuck cunningham syndrome and cheryl cole has got that so she was on american us x factor for four or five episodes disappeared no one's ever mentioned her again mm. over in the states i just find that odd yeah really. i mean and going back to what we said before about the ownership of the media and the fact that magazines are owned by say, the same people that own newspapers that own tv ch shows that that own various different media outlets all working in combination with each other, they can keep supplying that uh, scandal. Absolutely, yeah. And that keeping those stories going. That's right. To advertise and to, to make more profits for their other products. Ch just churning out stuff. Yeah, really, yeah. So. Now we're on to our new section. And uh, so I hope you've uh, been thinking I've been racking hard. my brains, John. Racking your brains. Yeah. Um, top three sports films top three sports ever made it's quite difficult um, there are so many rubbish ones out there there's never ever been a good film made about football no uh, part may be Escape to Victory but even that's terrible um, so what I've gone for is I've thought of three categories I've thought of documentary comedy and drama mm. and um, the documentary is one called Chasing Legends which is uh, 
if anybody who knows me knows I love cycling, love Tour de France. It's a documentary about the HTC High Road um, team during the 2009 Tour de France. It's fascinating. If anybody wants to know why I find it so exciting, just watch that documentary. For comedy, I think Blades of Glory. Um, I think Will Ferrell. I'm not a huge fan of his, but yeah. some some of the lines in that, I won't repeat them. Very, very funny. And then for a drama, and I just love Field of Dreams. I think it's an amazing film. Kevin Costner's best film for m- for my money. Um, it's a wonderful. It's full of pathos and full of human emotion and drama, and I just think it's amazing. Mm-hmm. So that's my top three. So what were some of the ones you you had to leave out then? Uh, on the cutting room floor, we had uh, American Flyers, which was a cycling one. That was Kevin Costner again. Oh, is that the one where where if He's got a tumour. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And he bleeds out his ear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I would watch that one as about ten. I yeah. Know. Couldn't work it uh, out. Rocky was close. Oh but, yeah. The, the first Rocky uh, film. Uh, yeah. The Champ as well, which is John Voight. Yeah, was a box is a weepy. Most upsetting uh, film uh, ever made. Yeah. Don't die, Champ. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's my impression. That was it's it. even more sad than Snoopy goes home. I don't know that one. Um, so yeah, those were the couple. So you know if. What I will say is, if anyone's listening and they, um, if anyone's listening and they want to, kind of contribute and send in your own versions, feel free to. Um, if you want to make some suggestions for a top three next week, which John will be, um, yeah, my turn next week. Yeah, so, so you know, don't make it too difficult. But oh, well, okay. So you know the place to get in touch with us. Um, see us around or email us on the normal address, and. Um, that's about it for this week, isn't That's it? That's it. Yeah, I mean, just to uh, thanks to our uh, producer, Alex Pollard, and um, you'll notice that we have a, a a fancy new, a fancy new theme tune going on, which we'd just like to get in there. So thanks to Alex for that. Yep. And we'll see you next week. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Goggle box.